Hi, everybody. Good evening. Welcome to Evoke Therapy program, Program's broadcast. I'm Dr. Brad Reedy. Today is Wednesday, March 15th, 2023. Tonight, I'm going to be talking about transporter. I realized as I was setting this up this evening that if you're watching it live, you're, you're probably an Evoke parent or an Evoke alumni parent. And so you've probably already made the decision one way or, or another to transport. And so really, it's not just about the transporting decision, but really about how to process the transporting decision. One of the things that inspired me to talk about this, this topic is uh, among other things in the media these days about the, 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 the area of the, the field of, of treatment for adolescents and families is this publicity around transport. The, 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 what the kids call it today is gooning. That's the phrase that they like to call it. That's not a phrase that was used years ago, but has come into vogue amongst the adolescent population today that, that call it that. So I'm going to talk about the impact of it. I think there's some, there's some really good, as always, some really good parenting principles and nuggets in the discussion of something like a transport that we'll get into as we go along tonight. So I'm excited about it. Some of what I'm taking is comes from a blog that I wrote, looks like eight years ago on transport. And like I said, this was long before the, this kind of new publicity, this new energy in the media around transport. But as I read through the blog, again, in, in preparation for this, I found that it's the same kind of discussion, the same kind of response that I'm having to the idea of transport. So if you want to look at that, you can go to our website, the Evoke Therapy web, website, and, and look at the blogs written by me, and you'll find this one from February 14, 2015. So what is transport? The typical format for a transport is two people that, that you hire to get your child from point A to point B. In most cases, the decision is made by the parent because, of course, the child would not be willing to go to therapy by invitation. The child is not willing to do it. The child is, at this point, in most cases, not becoming part of the solution in their own treatment process. So transporting is the decision that the parents make to make it as clean and safe and honest as possible I want to make that comment. They will often introduce the transports. This is a typical format. They will introduce the transports to the child. Usually it's early in the morning. That's that's not to necessarily just catch the child off guard, but because by the time that they fly, by the time that they drive to the, the office, get get their physical, get all their gear outfitted, and then drive to the, to the long drive out to the wilderness, you're talking about a full day. So it's a very early wake up. Uh, parents will often say very briefly, you know, we, these are two transporters. They're going to take you to a program, in our case, in Utah, um, where you're going to get treatment and help for the things that we're worried about. And then the parents will often leave, not just the room, but oftentimes they'll leave the house or, or, or go to where they're not going to be a part of the drama. Sometimes transport companies will ask for a letter from parents that that can happen that the transporters can then offer to the child during the transport, but, but sometimes they don't ask for that. Um, when I think about transport, because I've heard clients, students, parents, I've heard media, I've read media talk about this and how traumatic it can be. The way that I think about it, it's the intervention is starting at home in that moment. This is a, a, you know, a, a non-negotiable for the parents. Parents who are capable and able of talking their children into going to therapy, the, the, the children come with what we might say uh, agreeably. Oftentimes they feel a betrayal that comes later. They, they, the parent will sell it to them. The parent will kind of smooth out, out the rough edges. They, they might not be completely honest about the length of stay. Sometimes they'll just call it a, an assessment. Sometimes they'll even talk about it being a, a very short length of stay, like one or two weeks. Um, but no matter how hard they try to explain this, in fact, I've had students who have give, been given access to the website and had the opportunity to, to read what's written about wilderness therapy. Um, they still will say, even when, when told that it's going to be hard, you're often in the initial, initial phases not going to like it and going to be angry for being sent there. I've still had those clients talk about feeling betrayed. And I'll talk more about that as we go along. But the intervention starts in the home at that moment. This is the parents saying, we're sending you away. This is our choice. 
and we're owning it, and these two people are going to get there as safe as possible. I, I want to tell you that that in the old days, it was very common for people not to use transport companies. This is 15, 20 years ago to lie to them. And oftentimes we would get a, a, an incredibly volatile child arriving at our office, sometimes causing a lot of property damage, not just in our building, which did happen, but also in the rental car or the car that the parents took them, uh, brought them to the program in. So it's an honest entry into the intervention. One thing I like to mention is to ask the transport company as they do the intervention to be honest also. Transport company owners and those who train transporters, they, they train their, their transporters to be honest. That's the value of transporting a child is you don't have to sell them. You don't have to lie or, or, or try to pretty it up for them. You can just tell them this is an intervention. I don't know how long it's gonna last. That, that depends upon you and how you do in the process. This, this, this format allows you to be honest and to have integrity. Um, but like I said, even when parents try to try to say as much as they can to get kids to come and be as honest as they can, there's nothing that substitutes for that experience. Driving out to the wilderness, being dropped off with a group, being welcomed by a staff member or two, having a mentor introduce themselves to you, but sitting by yourself for the first evening and the, and the, the next day, can be a very difficult transition. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a dramatic shift, cultural shift. Um, I think it's a clear message that changes are happening in the family. I think transporting or the intervention itself, especially when it's done this way, this, this honest way, it sends a message to the child that we're not negotiating anymore, that we've been asking you for help. One of the things when people ask me, when is the right time to send my child to the program, to a program? My answer is you have to decide that on your own. I can't make that decision for you. But one thing I will say to the parent is if your child can't be a part of the solution at home, is not willing to or is unable to be a part of the solution or is at such severe risk that to wait for the solution and the, the healing to occur poses a great threat or danger to the child themselves or to others around them, you know, when you get to those points, this is the decision that makes the most sense. So that it's a message that, that things are shifting. I, and I will say this, those of you who are in the program know this, those of you who are, who are alumni of the program will know this, it's not just an intervention for the child. It's a family intervention. I think it's a parent program as much as anything. And I think that's one of the things that clients have historically complained about with these types of programs, with programs like Evoke, is that the parents weren't pushed to, to look at themselves, to, to be accountable for their parenting dynamics, for their parenting issues, and take responsibility for their con contributions to the cycle. The reason I called my book the, the, Hero the Journey of the Heroic Parent, in part, was because the heroic parent is the one who's willing to look at themselves. So when I talk to clients in the field about this, or I talk to alumni of other programs and talk about our message and how it really is a parent program, they're really relieved about that. They're really soothed by that, that idea. So it's, it's, it's a moment in time transporting is where uh, you're signaling that there's a shift in the family dynamics. Uh, there's this phrase in family systems theory that I learned in school. I was trained uh, in, in school and graduate school as a marriage and family therapist. That's what my, my doctoral degree is in. And in my, in my program, there was this idea of healthy betrayal. By the way, we didn't even know about, I didn't even know about wilderness therapy, and neither did virtually any of my professors. So they weren't talking about this, but they, they talk about this idea of a healthy betrayal. And that means that the status quo, the way that things are going as is, is going to change. And that is a betrayal. That's probably the first big message I want to send to you tonight is that when a parent or anybody, a partner even, or a child, an adult child, makes a shift towards healthy behaviors, others in the family will experience it either consciously or viscerally as a betrayal. You're changing the rules. I remember uh, when I took my dog to get dog training, I had a Rottweiler. He was the most loving, kind puppy, but he was stubborn as could be. And, and, and that was because of us, of course. And 
the the shift was when he came home that we were going to have to be different. We were going to have to betray the old climate, the old way of operating. So if you get hung up as a parent, and a lot of tonight what I'm going to talk about is where parents get hung up in this process. Part of the reason, not all of it, but part of the reason, or at least our contribution as adults to, to the issue of a child holding on to resentments and, and anger is because parents want to take it away from them. Parents want them to get over it. Parents want them to, to, to resolve those difficult, uncomfortable feelings. So part of what I'm, I'm saying right at the outset with this idea of healthy betrayal is you can own it. You can say, yeah, things are changing. Yes, I'm going to do things differently now. I'm going to respond. I'm going to behave differently as the parent. So family systems theory even talks about this idea of healthy betrayal as a necessary part uh, of the, the the person in the family who takes the first step towards health, towards a healthier dynamic, a healthier relationship dynamic, that they are, in essence, betraying the old pattern, the old ways. I think of transporting and the, the start of the intervention as a balloon payment. Some of you might not be familiar with the phrase balloon payment. Maybe most of you are. But a balloon payment in, in finance is when you, you get some sort of loan. And to ease the burden of the loan, you make smaller payments than, than, than necessary to catch up over, let's say, a 10-year period of time. But that last payment is extra large because leading up to that last payment, you've, you've underpaid. And I think that wilderness therapy and, and transporting, taking such a, I think what a lot of people experience and think of as a very dramatic step like this, is a balloon payment. I talked about it in the preface of the journey of the heroic parent. I was talking about adventure therapy programs and how ours is not predominantly an adventure therapy program. Ours is a trek model, a, a nomadic model. And, and what I said was, you know, whether whether we switch or not to a to an adventure model or add more adventure is not really relevant. The fact of the matter is, though those programs they appeal to parental guilt a lot. The parent can say to themselves, my, my, my child is going to go uh, whitewater rafting or, or mountain bike, biking or rappelling. And that, that soothes their conscience. But And that's fine. It's fine that that's going to happen at the program. But the, the, the point that I want to make is, unless you address the underlying dynamic where the parent is held hostage by their guilt, the family is going to have a difficult time moving to where they need to go in their healing and their healthy relationship process. So, so sending somebody to a program is kind of like a, a balloon payment. Often transport is the safest. This is the most important thing, I think, the, the, the thesis of tonight. Often transport is the safest and most drama-free way to get a child into treatment. It goes a long way to making the transition safe and respectful. I've had parents that are on that fence about whether or not to transport. And of course, the ones who do know nothing different. And the ones who don't essentially know nothing different either. But it's not uncommon. In fact, it's more common than not that the ones who make the decision to, to, to take the child themselves end up with, with stories that can be dangerous at, at the worst end of it, but really, really painful, even in some of the better case scenarios. Tantrums, property destruction, violence, threats, words that, that, that the child might say in a moment of fear or anger or hurt or frustration that, that, that last, that leave their mark. And transporting takes away that opportunity. Again, if you make the decision one way or the other and you're only doing it one time, you know nothing else. But my experience is that overall that the kids that come to the program transported are in a better spot to begin with. The child will not appreciate anything I just said. And it's not their job to appreciate anything I just said, any of the above. So the parent is not spared from the child's anger in a transport. At some point, the child's anger will need to be heard, primarily by the parent, so that the child can move through their feelings. And again, this is getting to the, the, the more general idea in therapy. And I cannot underscore this enough. 
our contribution to helping our child move through emotions or, or maybe more accurately help them uh, allow them support them in helping the emotion uh, the emotions move through them our contribution to them getting through it is to not ask them to get through it our desire for the children for our child not to feel pain not to feel frustration not to feel anger at us is actually in many cases speaking of the process in families in many cases is the poison not the cure and that's what psychotherapy is that's what wellness therapy is is it's a place where you go and you learn how to feel and so you're going to get letters from your child that, that are angry that are hurt letters and you're going to be coached by your therapist ideally this happens in outpatient therapy too everywhere every version of therapy where you're asked to listen to, to be accountable where you can to to listen at the very least and not defend or justify your position and when you allow the child to feel when there's no resistance to the feeling they get over it they move through it the, the stuckness uh, of the stage of the feeling for the child of the person doesn't even have to be a child is often related to the energy by somebody else around them trying to get them over it but when you're allowed to feel when there's no resistance to it you you let it go i've told this story many times not specifically in the context of you know creating the intervention with, with transports but i've talked about how my son my adult son in his late 20s he, i sent him to the program when he was 13 he turned 14 while in the wilderness he was asked by the by the parents in a, in a parent support group where he was visiting did you hold resentments for your father towards your parents for, for the intervention and he kind of looked confused and, and, and stumbled and, and stuttered and after he left because he was leaving he was planning on leaving halfway through the group i said to the the parents present i said it it wouldn't have been a resentment because because he would be allowed to be angry with it he would allowed to hate it he would allow to dis he was allowed to disagree with it so that's the embodiment that i'm describing that's parenting and, and i make plenty of mistakes and all of these broadcasts are littered but with examples that i give of my mistakes but that that idea was something that i was able to, to to execute and to say you get to be mad you get to hate it one of my favorite moments specific moments that's been replicated in, in, in various ways over the years is when a young man threatening to, to kill himself to get back at his parents for being sent to the program his mother actually his father wasn't in the picture um, trying to hold her hostage blackmailing her threatening her with all kinds of things at the very end he was actually sad to be going home and his mother was confused by this given the first several weeks of the program he, he filled his letters with, with this, this this vile anger toward her resentment toward her and he said mom in some ways this program was the easiest place i've ever been because i was allowed to be angry i was allowed to be angry with the staff i was allowed to have my feelings and, and and while in this specific instance transport speaking of transports the the children who are complaining about it are, are resentful and angry about it will tell you that, that what i'm teaching you is 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 harmful or, or not helpful it's what they want in the big picture it doesn't serve them right now because they can't leverage you over it but in the big picture this is what they're begging for this is what children need from their parents Children need their parents to have a sufficient sense of their own self so that the child can be angry with you, hurt by you, feel betrayed by you, whatever they need to feel. And that's, that's the, 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 one of the, the contexts that, that good therapy introduces us into is that you're allowed to feel angry, upset, disappointed. I teach that to our therapists, not just working with adolescents, but working with parents. If, if a client, or in our case, the parent of a client, but at our intensive program, if a client is willing to express anger toward you, hurt, frustration toward you, the therapist, you have a golden opportunity 
to respond from a place of, of self, of strength, of healing, and to say, I am so glad you're talking about it. Thanks for telling me. I'm sorry, I'll try to do better. So this is not for the children. None of what I'm saying tonight is something that you should repeat to them. I mean, they can listen to the podcast if they want to, and they, they want to find it. But the point is, anytime you try to justify, defend, debate, prop up your decision by, by lecturing or by teaching the child, you're contributing to the problem. They get to feel angry. They get to disagree with you. They get to disagree with me and with a therapist. Sometimes, like I said, commonly it's referred to as gooning or being gooned by the kids that have experienced it. And this is simply just an expression of the anger that they have toward their parents, toward the, the dramatic departure from the status quo. One of the questions that I get asked, especially with adopted children is, you know, we're an attachment based program. That's our whole foundation clinically of our program. How can you separate parents and children? How can you do something? How can you support something like transporting? We don't specifically, we don't do the transports ourselves, right? Transport companies bring the students to us, but how can you endorse and receive kids this way? And let me talk a little bit about how it lines up. It doesn't, it doesn't betray attachment theory and at, at, at what we're, what we call attachment based therapy. Attachment is based on responding to the child's specific needs. That is the foundation of a secure attachment. Responding to the child's needs. So first off, that's in line with attachment. It's not about proximity. It's not about how close you are to somebody. That's not attachment. It's about being in a relationship such a way that even if they need to get help from somebody else, you allow it. Part of me sending two of my children to the program, one to the wilderness program, one did a 30 day pursuits program. Part of me sending them with somebody else is to say, I'm too close to this. Yes, of course, I'm educated in family therapy, family systems theory, attachment theory. I have all of that. But when I drop you off at your softball game or your soccer game or, or your school, or in this case, your, your therapeutic program, I'm in essence saying some, you need to get something from somebody else that they're better equipped to give to you, not because they care about you more. Nobody loves my children more than I do. You know, my, my, their mother, you know, we're neck and neck for our love for our children and nobody even comes close. But sometimes that, that closeness also obscures our vision. We get confused between our needs and their needs all the time. So attachment theory, th this idea of, of, of differentiation, of individuating, of temporarily pulling things apart, pulling people apart so they can focus on themselves, get grounded, do some of their own individual healing, sets them up for the possibility, the probability of being a, in, a, in a long, lifelong relationship with each other that is healthier, that is more resonant. The, the key ingredient, the, the keystone in all of this is the, the foundation of self and the parent. That's why we do these broadcasts. Nobody in our field, I've been doing these broadcasts since 2007, December 18th, 2007, over 15 years. Many weeks, twice a week, some weeks only once a week, but I've been doing these for 15 years approximately 1500 episodes. We do this to support you. We do this because the greatest contribution that you can make, and the research is clear on this point, the greatest contribution that you can make to your child's well-being is your work, your awareness, your sense of self, your overcoming guilt and shame and fear. You're finding other areas of support you are becoming and getting in touch with your authentic self, recognizing your own issues, addressing them, making your life, your mental health, your project, not the child. You know, children like us, they don't like to be the project. People don't like to be the project. 
So the shift is that, that is partly facilitated by this this temporary separation is start working on the right project. The right project is you, mom and dad. And and, and we say the same thing to the child. The right project is you. Oftentimes they'll talk about what horrible parents you are or have been, or maybe even how this intervention is evidence of what a horrible parent you are. And I will say to them, casually, I'll say, you know, they might not ever change. You might go back and things might be exactly the same. In fact, I tell them, it's probably a good idea to plan for that. Because what planning for that does for you is it shifts your focus on trying to change your parents to changing you. That's what both people are doing in this relationship, right? Both people are trying to change the other one and essentially, psychologically, holding the other one responsible for their happiness. And I would even argue that children, children, the, children the, the case for the child blaming the parent is actually a better case than, than the parent blaming the, the child. The, the case for the child blaming the parent is, is more cogent than the parent blaming the child. But, but in the big picture, especially because adolescence is this transition from childhood and, and the, the, the launch of the pre-launch into adulthood, it is to take responsibility for your life. And the foundation of self on the parent is the keystone for all of this work. The child does not care. Uh, the child does not take care of the parent and risks sacrificing their authentic or real self. And what I mean by that is when you are willing to do the hard thing and, and people listening, I know you know what that means because you've done it. You've done it in various ways. Sometimes you don't. Sometimes I don't. But you've done it. When the parent is willing to do the hard things and hold their own self-esteem on their own shoulders, to, to look in the mirror, to look at their co-parenting partner, to go to a psychotherapist or a support group and take responsibility for their serenity, for their life's happiness. You essentially say to the child, it's not your job to take care of me. It's my job to take care of me. That is foundational in this work. And I will tell you this, I work at it all the time and I fail and stumble all the time with this. And I pick myself up eventually after I stumble and fall and I try it again. And some days, some moments, some specific situation, I am thriving. And other moments, other days, other periods of time, other issues, I'm up against it. I'm struggling. But the, the fundamental shift in dynamic is that the parent is taking care of the parent. The parent is making the parent the project and not making the child the project anymore. Individuation and differentiation, these ideas of being separate but connected, having boundaries but staying connected and empathic, and caring and in contact with, these are key ingredients to attachment. Individuation is not some, some kind of intellectualized version of selfishness. Individuation is taking responsibility for your own, your own journey, your own serenity, as they say in, in Al-Anon, your own happiness. It makes your life better, and by extension, it makes your child's life better in the long run. In the immediate run, you start to separate your feelings from their feelings. You start to not take on their anger as evidence that you've done something wrong necessarily, although you'll ask the question. You start to, to separate in those ways. Yes, initially, there's resistance, as there always is when anybody in a family takes a step towards health and healing. There's resistance. But in the long run, they're going to want to call you when they're in a tough spot because you'll be able to listen, not react out of anxiety or fear, not try to fix it, but listen and ask how you can support a need. You, you, you want to be that, that phone call. See, attachment, a secure attachment means that the parent becomes the safe base from which the child can explore the world. And when they're very young, that, that, that is physical proximity. But as the child grows and, and stretches and moves out into the world, it would be more like a phone call or a text. I'm having a tough time. I'm overwhelmed. I made a huge mistake. 
I'm in a mess. I need some, some help, some support, or I just need you to tell me that it's going to be okay. Or I need a suggestion with, with something that's worked for you. You want to be that first phone call. I, I say this sometimes in parent education, that one of the goals of, of healthy parenting is to be the first call, not the fifth call or the 10th call. And if you don't have a, a, a sense of self, if you're, if you're wrought with anxiety, if the world is an unsafe place for you, you're not going to be the first call. And I wouldn't even encourage the child to, 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 to make that first call to you. Right? If you're going to have a trauma response, an anxious response, and the child's looking for, for someone to, to help support them, I would encourage them, that, that adult child, to call somebody else. Or I would support them in calling somebody else first. You're not going anywhere in the big picture and you're going to do your work. You're going to do your work because you need support. Parenting is impossibly difficult, right? Impossibly difficult. Parenting a child who's struggling with, with mental health issues or, or addictions is exponentially more difficult. So you need even more support in your life to develop the capacity, to have the capacity. Again, attachment-based, the, 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 the father of attachment theory said, this is a quote, Bowlby stated that boarding schools could be useful for children eight years old and older. If the child is maladjusted, he said, it may be useful for him to be away for part of the year from the tensions which produced his difficulties. The boarding school has the advantage of preserving the child's all important home ties, even if in slightly attenuated form. Moreover, by relieving the parents of the, uh, of the children for part of the year, it will be possible for some of them to develop more favorable attitudes towards their children during the remainder. I know he's talking about boarding school, but, but let me just extrapolate from what he's saying. It can be really healthy. It can be really healthy for that separation. It's why, like I've said before, when I go to a, uh, one of my children's sporting events, practice, the game I show up. But when I go to the practice, I drop them off and I leave. Because they need to experience in this small little way a bit of the world. And if things get tense, if the dynamic is heated, if nervous systems are, are, are raw and reactive, Distance could be a way to resettle the nervous system. It could be a way to, to reset patterns. And that comes from, like I said, the father of attachment theory, Alice Miller, who wrote, in my opinion, the most important book on child development that's ever been written, The Drama of the Gifted Child, said in her book. I did change, change some of the words here because back in 1979 when she wrote it, it was always about mothers. And I don't like necessarily lumping all of that on top of mothers. Sometimes it's referred to as a functional mother, but I just put parent. I replace her, her, her words with parent in this. If a child is lucky enough to grow up with a mirroring available parent who is at the child's disposal, that is a child's development, then healthy self-feeling can gradually develop in the growing child. Ideally, this parent should also provide the necessary emotional climate and understanding for the child's needs. But this is where it gets important. But even a parent who is, a, who is not especially warm-hearted can make this development possible if only they refrain from preventing it and allow the child to acquire from other people what they themselves lack. One of the reasons why I sent my son to the program and later on my son to, to do a pursuit trip was because I knew that they could give him, they could give each of them something that I couldn't. They could do it better. The biggest advantage I have in helping your child is I'm not you. I'm less triggering, less reactive. Less of my identity is wrapped up in the child. I can listen to you. I've said this before. Listening to a child cry is not the most painful sound in the world. Listening to your child cry, mom and dad, is the most painful sound in the world. It is in our DNA. We are programmed to respond to the crying child. But, but that doesn't necessarily mean, especially if we have unhealed trauma, especially if we're not practicing self-care and self-awareness through psychotherapy 
or some equivalent process. We become compromised in those moments. I can listen to your child cry with perspective, with, with objectivity with some distance where I can still maintain my creativity and my, my, my cognitive functioning, my most, my highest levels of thinking. I can do that with your child. Our staff can do that with your child. The transporters can do that with your child. That's the advantage. They don't get wrapped up and lost in it like I would with my own child, like you would do with, with your child. We do. If we're honest with ourselves, you know, virtually most of us will admit it. Even if our style is, is, is a flight response, that still is a reactive trigger response. That still is a trauma response. So part of parenting is allowing other people give our children what we are unable to give them. And providing those mentors, those teachers, those opportunities. Sometimes very clearly, the, 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 the message today is that transport is traumatic. I've even had home therapists talk about it on the front end and the back, back end is PTSD. And I could give you anecdotal stories where that, that idea, that diagnosis has been debunked. But let me just say, let me just talk about trauma. In the most basic sense, the child gets to decide, the person themselves gets to decide whether something is traumatic or not. I don't get to decide. You don't get to decide. Again, the instinct that we have as parents to say, well, it's not that bad, or you want to know what real trauma is. That is the problem in our communication, in our relationships, in our psychology, in our families. That is dismissive. That is not hearing. That is not validating. Everybody gets to decide what's traumatic. And the more that we can let it pass through us, the more that we can maintain a very light grip on the ideas of what's traumatic and what's not for somebody else the more helpful we are in supporting somebody to get to where they need to go. So the child gets to decide whether something is traumatic or not. We don't, I don't, you don't. The intervention itself is traumatic. No matter how they get here, the intervention is traumatic. As I've mentioned, it has that, that element of healthy betrayal. It, it's, it's a radical departure from the status quo. A huge shift, right? Other ways of getting the child may be as traumatic or even more traumatic. I, I found that, that um, children who entered the program via transport were a week or two on average, not always true, ahead of children that were talked into coming. The children that were talked into coming would say things like, my parents didn't tell me what it's going to be like, or they didn't know what it was like. I need to talk to them. And oftentimes we'd have to, sometimes we'd give a phone call or sometimes we'd have the parent write a letter saying, I'm glad that you came willingly, but I was going to make this decision either way. We were going to make this decision either way. The, the bottom line is like with most things in life, you don't get to be right. You get to choose how to lose. I repeat that phrase in my head every single day of my life working as a psychotherapist, working as a parent, as a husband, as a friend. You get to choose how to lose. You don't get to win. And for me, I, I like the idea of being honest. I like the idea if my children are going to be safe, that I would rather have them transported than I would um, have them feel betrayed or, or, or lied to. But that doesn't mean I win. They're going to blame me either way, either way. My daughter said, I've been telling you this lately. In fact, it's at the bottom of the slide here. My daughter said recently, 15-year-old daughter, she said, Dad, I'm the only, buddy, only person that I know, my age, who knows that everybody has trauma. When I tell that to my friends, she says, they look at me like I'm crazy and say, no, we don't. And she went on to say, even if I left this family with my specific complaints, about my parents and went to another family that looked good from the outside, there would be a, just a different kind of trauma. Better, worse, different. But you can't escape it. You don't get to escape losing in this process. In fact, I think that's part of the hero's journey. You don't justify 
You don't stand on, on the ground of certainty, knowing that everything that you did is, is right. You stand knowing that it, you've made mistakes, some of what you know and some of what you don't. And you're going to learn about some later that you're, that you're doing now. I do that. I find myself, uh, I feel like my life as a parent, as a person in relationship to others, to my wife, I, I feel like my, my growth is exponential. But what that means is, not that I'm becoming enlightened, but that I'm still learning about the mistakes that I'm making, the mistakes I made yesterday and last week and last year and 10 years ago. The parent work that you have to do is the same either way. I was just explaining this to my, my 30 year old son last night. We were talking about relationships and I was explaining to him, getting divorced, getting married, staying married, sending a child away isn't the answer. The answer is in coming to know yourself. And then those decisions are evidence of the answer that you found. The work is the same, same either way. I happen to really like transport because it's clean. And, and by the way, if you don't need to transport, that's okay. Also, if you can get the child there respectfully and safely, honestly, Fantastic. So what do you do? What do, what would you do? What do you say if the child claims that transporting and wilderness for that matter is traumatic? You listen, you apologize for not knowing for sure. You definitely do not justify your decision. You don't quote Dr. Brad Reedy or any other therapist for that matter and stand self-satisfied with the fact that you've gathered, you've recruited the experts to say that you've done the right thing, that you've been a good parent. It sounds like I hear you. I'm sorry. I can, I can hear that it was traumatic for you. It may have been a mistake. I don't know. It's the best that I could do. And it may have very well been a mistake. And, and, and that's not a technique. I'm saying it like it's a technique, but that's where you get to when you do your work. That's what it sounds like when you've done your work. When you haven't done your work, you say, well, let me show you the research, or we had no other choice, or it, you, it was really you who sent yourself that, sent yourself to the program. That's what it sounds like when you haven't done your work. When you have done your work, you say, I'm sorry. Thank you for telling me. It might've been a mistake. It wasn't the only one that I've made and I'm willing to listen. Essentially the, the, the core task is to let them feel and think what they feel and think. This is from one of the blogs that I wrote that I referred to earlier, perhaps just as therapeutically important to rehabilitating the parent child relationship is the concept of letting your child feel their feelings. Even though these undesired feelings may include angry, abandoned, betrayed, kidnapped, or traumatized. Your job is to listen to them and validate their feelings without requiring consensus or defending yourself. Parents who convince their children to attend a VOC later get complaints from their kids that they feel lied to and tricked. Even when parents try to be democratic in getting their children to sign up for themselves, sign themselves up for the program, the family will not be able to escape the fact that their child will likely have negative emotions. But that's what healthy parents are able to do. And, and I, I think you know that because you're all children of parents and you have some sense of whether or not you could share uncomfortable feelings with your, your parents. I think I shared with you that I had a colleague, uh, we were on a business trip together and I shared with her this, what I thought was a, a, an interesting idea on social media, on, on a post that I saw that somebody wrote that said, if you say your father's a jerk, your friends around you will, will support you and say, yeah, you know, he was a jerk. But if you say your mom was a jerk, it's not uncommon to get responses like, but I'm sure she loved you. And I kind of chuckled at, at that. And my, my colleague said, I, I don't think that's true. I said, okay. I wasn't trying to say it was, but I said, okay. She said, I don't think it's true for me. And then after about a 10 second pause, she said, you know what? I thought about sharing this on my feed, on my, my social media feed. 
And I realized I, I worried about how my mother would feel about it. And I said, there it is. You're still carrying, like many of us, around the burden of your mother's ego in this case. You're still bearing the responsibility of your mother's self-esteem. It's not uncommon. It could be mother or father, for that matter. Like I said, how it looks in the wilderness to me when children arrive by transport, or, or rather they are transported by their parents, the most important and hopefully comforting truth for parents to hear may be my experience as a field therapist. In most cases, transporting your child to a program using a professional agency accelerates the intervention by one to two weeks. In other words, children professionally transported take less time to engage in therapy when compared to children traveling to the program after a long extended battle or negotiation with their parents. Non-transported children often need to hear reinforcement of the decision and follow-up letters and communication from parents. Parents must, quote, restate, unquote, the need for the child to complete the program and its emotional curriculum in order for the child to let go of the fantasy of being rescued. My son even said that at one point. He actually went straight from the courthouse after something silly that he did in our neighborhood, went straight from the courthouse. I was out of town, all of this happened overnight to, to our, our folks who picked them up because they were, they were close enough and they worked for me. So they picked them up but he kept waiting for me to rescue him. You know, I, I want to think he had some crazy idea about me, but somewhere I had taught him that eventually his, his suffering, his crying, his pleading would eventually get to me. He was there for 16 weeks, by the way. Related to this idea of transport and trauma is will my child forgive me? A very common questions parents ask on the front end and sometimes during and after. And it's like the feeling thing I mentioned earlier. Your needing the child to forgive is your need. It's about your ego. Wanting or needing forgiveness from your child is one way to impede it. If we have the wherewithal as adults to know ourselves, accept ourselves as human, and have clarity about our intentions, we won't need their forgiveness. You know what that feels like. Part of my answer is they'll forgive you when they grow up and heal. Here's the deal. Every parent, every person who has children listening to my, to my voice, including me, everybody has dented their child in some ways. That's not an abdication of the responsibility of being a parent. It's just a fact. It's part of a, my, my daughter said to me the other day, this is two nights ago. She said, Dad, you said to, did you say to me at one time that no parent should use shame or guilt for their children? I said, I, I don't, I probably didn't say should. And I said to her, I don't really use that word in that kind of a context. But I probably said it would be ideal. And she said, yeah, but you use it sometimes. And I said, I do. But I said, but, but the fact of the matter, this is a human experience an imperfect, flawed experience. So you've hurt your children. You've hurt your children by your passivity. Some of your non-choices have hurt your, your children. Your reactiveness, your unhealed trauma has leaked onto them in the form of reactions, anger, punishment, shame, guilt. We've all done it. I mean, that's really what doing your work, as I'm going to talk about in two weeks, is about. It's about realizing you're coming in contact, staying in contact, with your humanness, with your humanity. We've all done it. And so to grow up and to heal, the child has to forgive the parent, not for the parent's sake, but for their own sake. It's a part of healing. It doesn't mean that, they, that, that, that when people forgive, it doesn't mean they relax boundaries, especially if the abuse is still occurring. It just means that they can move through the emotions. They can grieve. Right? I've, I've been thinking a lot in the last week or two about this idea of, of, of grieving, about how a long, a, a well-lived life will have many metaphorical deaths in it, many losses. I used to say when I was a, a, a young adult, I loved my mother on a scale of 1 to 100. Let's say I loved her an 80, making up a number. And I saw her pathology 
somewhere around maybe a 50 on a scale of 100. I thought she was pretty average. Now, 30 years later, I have a lot more awareness. And I realized her pathology was probably up in the 75 range. I don't love her any less. I would actually argue that I even love her more. But I have boundaries. I have boundaries. Children forgive when they grow up, when they heal. And they're going to have to do it regardless of this intervention or not. And this growing up, this healing usually happens after you don't need them to forgive you, to feel okay. Again, do your best. Always do your best because that's all you can do. Remember this maxim. You're doing the best you can. You can always do better. At any given moment in time, those two things can both be true. You're doing the best you can and you can do better. You are, you, you are human and have made and will make numerous mistakes. And part of embracing that humanity and modeling for the child means that they get to tell you when they're angry, when they're hurt. I said the most damaging secret that a child is asked to keep isn't whether they're gay or straight, isn't whether they're going to marry this person or that person. It's not whether they've snuck out at night or lied or skipped classes. Those secrets aren't the toxic ones. The most damaging secret that a child keeps, that a child is asked unconsciously to keep, is the, the uncomfortable feelings they have towards their parents. These quotes on forgiveness that I'm describing also came in a blog posted on March 18th, 2016. So you can go to our website and read the blog, Will My Child Forgive Me? So your relationship to the child's feelings, attempts to control the child's feelings or perceptions are telltale signs of an unhealthy and unstable relation, unsustainable relationship. Paradoxically, as I've mentioned many times this evening, the more you try to sell them on the idea, the more they tend to dig in. Instead of discussing long-term health in more respectful relationships, the argument becomes a power struggle where the battlefield is over the right for everyone to feel what they feel and think what they think. That is the, the, the underlying premise, the, the golden thread woven throughout this intervention from, from transport to the day that they are financially independent of you. You want, to, you want them to come visit you when you're older? Let them be who they are. Feel what they feel. Think what they think. You can have boundaries of, about the way they treat you. And you can even have boundaries if they, if they have beliefs that you can't even tolerate listening to. You're allowed to have that. But understand, the more rigid, the less capable of a container that you are, the smaller that you are, in other words, the less time they're probably going to want to spend around you. Unless, of course, it's just coming from a place of pure obligation, uh, of guilt, uh, of should. But that's not a real relationship. That's not the one that I want with my children. My daughter, my adult daughter, 28-year-old daughter, wrote this last year. Remember the context. This is my daughter. She said, one of the most loving things a parent can do is be willing to be the cast as the villain in their child's story. I believe that's true, and it's not easy. It is a, a practice. And you're not as good at, at it as you think. And I know that because I've come to terms with this idea over the course of my life, hundreds and hundreds of times, believing that I was much farther along than I, than I thought I was. So what are the take homes? You have a choice. Get references, ask the transport companies about their process. However, you don't get to win in this process. You do not get to come out on top, but you do get to be you. If you take our invitation and go to Al-Anon or Codependence Anonymous or go to psychotherapy or get an evoke coach or come to an intensive, come to an intensive, you'll start to feel what that feels like, feels like in your body. We learn to surrender. A, a friend of mine gave me a book during one of my midlife crises. 
called Death of a Hero, Birth of a Soul, about the, the journey of man and masculinity in midlife. James Hollis, I read his book. He has several books on the middle passage, he calls it. He's a Jungian therapist. He quoted, quoted Jung in there saying that, that death is the, the, the middle of a well-lived long life. We learn to let go. We learn to surrender. We learn to give up being the hero and becoming a soul, which means in psychological terms, becoming who we are. They have a choice on how to feel and what they call traumatic. If they heal and mature, they'll see what they need to see, but you can't get them there. And your agenda to get them there or get them there quickly is an issue. Don't defend yourself, justify, explain, or ask them to understand your predicament. And they often will ask. It's a trap. It's a trap. The best answer is to say, well, you can always try answering it, by the way, see how it goes. But it probably will be a springboard into an argument, to a power struggle. But in essence, the best answer is, I don't know. I don't know the right answer. Becoming uncertain is, is, is the sign of, of burgeoning enlightenment, right? When we can be uncertain, uncertain, when we can learn to not know. It's its, its own form of wisdom. I, I might even argue it's, it's perhaps the most wise. They want or need differentiation and individuation, but in the immediate moment, in this exact context, it's not gonna serve them. I would teach that to them in the field. I would say, look, trying to create some distance between you and your parent. I, I know that makes you less capable of manipulating, of guilting them. I know that in this moment, I'm giving you less of a, a, a hook into them, but in the long run, it's, what, it's the only thing you'll be able to tolerate. You'll need separation. You'll need to be yourself. You'll need them to take responsibility for their own anxiety. And then lastly, I'll just end with, you know, when does the intervention begin in earnest? It can start in your home in that moment, in earnest, or it could start when you drop them off at the office yourself. Either way, you get to decide. You get to choose how to lose. All right, folks, I'll take any live questions next time in our Q&A. So I'll skip that for tonight because we're up against the hour. You can get your phone ready. Take a, take a point it at the screen here. Those of you that are watching live or watching on YouTube and the QR codes will take you to your respective, to the respective website or web page. My two books, The Journey of the Heroic Parent and The Audacity to Be You are available on Amazon and Audible. If you want to do a deep dive into your own work, think, think springboard. If you don't know what your own work is, this is a great place to go. In my opinion, as a participant, and I think I've shared almost as many times as I've talked about this, that I've done it. My business partners have done it. My wife has done it. My adult children have done it. My children want to go back. I've done it seven times. I've done one with my wife. I believe in these. And I've paid full price for every one of them. Finding you is our intensive. It's our springboard or and well, the way I think of it now is it's a therapy accelerator because I go to therapy. So it's a therapy accelerator. March 22nd, there, there is that one spot left, I think. April 19th is the next offering. We also have online versions, May 19th to 21st. Online versions are over the weekend, so you don't have to miss work, maybe half a day of work. It's about a third of the cost and you don't have to travel. We started them during the pandemic and I was very skeptical, but I ran the first couple and found that we had so many of the same benefits, powerful benefits, experiential benefits from doing it online. So we kept it online even after the pandemic restrictions loosened. We also have a returning to you available is in October 11th through 15th. If you've been to a finding you and you want to come back, returning to you is your program. I'm doing a finding you in the UK, June 23rd through 25th. There may be a spot left there. We have custom finding connection intensives for couples or finding family for families. Uh, you can go, go to the QR code there or email intensives at evoketherapy.com. We have support groups for current and alumni Willers families. The next offering is tomorrow night, March 16th at 6.30 p.m. Mountain Time. Once a month, we have an alumni-only meeting, alum, parent-alumni-only meeting 
March 28th at 6.30 p.m. is that offering. And we have a meeting each week, excuse me, each month for intensives alumni and coaching, coaching clients and alumni. April 11th at 6 p.m. Mountain Time is our next offering there. Contact Sarah D, S-A-R-A-D, at evoketherapy.com or go to our family involvement page on our website and the QR code will take you there. If you want an individual coach, parenting coach, individual coach, couples coach, family coach, we have coaches that have been, that do provide telehealth in, in the attachment framework that I've been discussing. All of these therapists have been trained in the attachment model, clarifying boundaries, communication skill building, transitioning to home after treatment. And in my opinion, don't start when they get home, start before they get home. You can reach out to, uh, you can email us at coaching at evoketherapy.com to find out more about our coaching option. We ask all parents to go to, 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 to try at least six of the following 12 step support groups and support groups, any combination of alanon.org, coda.org, familiesanonymous.org, adultchildren.org, refuge recovery.org is a Buddhist inspired recovery program, less of an emphasis on a higher power, a uh, real strong emphasis on mindfulness and the national Alliance on mental illness, nami.org is a great place to go in your local chapter. They have classes, they have resources that are free. All these broadcasts are available on Spotify or your favorite podcast app. Just search Finding You and Evoke Therapy Podcast. You can also go to soundcloud.com on your computer, or you can watch the rebroadcast of these on our, on our YouTube channel, Evoke's YouTube channel. You can find Evoke Therapy programs and me, Dr. Brad Reedy, on Twitter and Instagram using the handles at Evoke Therapy and at Dr. Brad Reedy, respectively. And you can find our Evoke Intensives program on Instagram using the handle at Evoke Therapy Intensives. On Facebook, you can find us by searching Evoke Therapy Programs or Evoke Therapy Intensives. And of course, like I mentioned earlier, we have a wonderful blog with new content um, all the time. If you want to give back for people that can't afford therapy or if you need help, the three charitable partners that we work with are ChooseMentalHealth.org, SkiesTheLimitFund.org, and the EvokeFamilyFoundation.org. All right, folks. My next broadcast will be next Tuesday, March 21st, 21st, 6.30 p.m. Mountain Time. That'll be a live Q&A. You can always send in questions, suggestions in between broadcasts to webinar at evoketherapy.com. Those will be queued up in the first part. You can send them in. If you're, even if you're listening on the podcast, you can send them in, and then you can hear your, your answer that I give live um, recorded on the, the podcast or the broadcast. Thank you for joining me this evening. I hope this is a helpful point of contact. Even if you're not at the initial stage, I hope that you could feel some of the relevance for you. For and behalf of the people that love you and the people that you love, thank you for showing up and, and being willing to do your work. Have a great evening, and I'll talk to you next week on the 21st. Bye-bye.